Muhammad Hijab and I don't agree on much, but we do agree on this. Allah prays for Muhammad. In my opening statement, I showed that according to the Quran, Allah and his angels pray for Muhammad. Allah prays. People ask, if Jesus is God, why does he pray? I have to remind them that we're Trinitarians. It makes perfect sense for the Son to speak to the Father. It makes much less sense, given the Islamic concept of God, for Allah to pray. In Surah 33, verse 56 of the Quran, we read, Surely Allah and his angels pray for the Prophet. O you who believe, pray for him and salute him with a worthy salutation. Allah and his angels pray for the Prophet. Translators try to hide this by translating it as Allah and his angels send blessings or show mercy or they praise him. The problem here is that what it says Allah does is salah. And you know what that means. You know there are perfectly good Arabic ways of saying all of those other things. Every Arab speaker in the world knows that salah means prayer. And it says that Allah does salah. So, who is Allah praying to? Notice I said that Allah prays for Muhammad. I said it twice very clearly. Surely Allah and his angels pray for the Prophet. Allah and his angels pray for the Prophet. Mr. Hijab said that he knew I would bring this up. I've insisted many times in the past that according to the Quran, Allah prays for Muhammad. Mr. Hijab was aware of this, so he was prepared to respond. How did he respond? Well, he claimed that I've made some career-ending blunders. Most significantly, I embarrassingly mistranslated the Arabic. Just as a reminder, what did I say? The Quran claims, Surely Allah and his angels pray for the Prophet. Mr. Hijab was ready for this, so he proceeded to smash my mistranslation. He says, Allah says, uh, that Allah yusalli ala nabi and he's here saying that he prays to the Prophet. There's a difference between yusalli lahu and yusalli ala in the Arabic language. I knew this was going to happen. I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> I knew I was going to have to give you a free Arabic lesson here today. I knew it. And that's why the translators put for, not to the Prophet. You don't know what the, the words in Arabic mean. Don't hear, speak salah. Come on, please, don't embarrass yourself. According to Mr. Hijab, what did I say? And he's here saying that he prays to the Prophet. What did I actually say multiple times? Surely Allah and his angels pray for the Prophet. Allah and his angels pray for the Prophet. What's the correct translation? And that's why the translators put for not to the Prophet. So Allah prays for Muhammad is the correct translation? For, not to the Prophet. And what did I say was the correct translation? Surely Allah and his angels pray for the Prophet, for the Prophet, for the Prophet. So my career is over because I mistranslated the Arabic by translating it the exact same way Mr. Hijab translated it. And he knew that I would bring this up, so this was his prepared refutation. Notice, he didn't deny that Allah prays. He denied that Allah prays to Muhammad. But I never said that he did. I said that he prays for Muhammad. As a side note, Mr. Hijab and I are both interpreting the language here in the same way. The Quran literally says that Allah prays on Muhammad. I don't quite understand what it means to pray on someone. I assume it's another way for saying pray for. Just as when a Christian says, can I pray over you, it's another way of saying, can I pray for you. But whether or not Allah prays on Muhammad really means Allah prays for Muhammad is irrelevant. The real point here is that Allah prays. Surely Allah and his angels pray for the Prophet. And Mr. Hijab admits it. So how does he get around the argument? By lying about what I said and then attacking the words that he made up. And that's why the translators put for, 
not to the prophet. Just so everyone knows, this is a classic debate trick. You claim that your opponent said something that he didn't say, and then you refute something that he didn't say and claim victory. Since Mr. Hijab studies fallacies in logic, this is called the straw man fallacy. Mr. Hijab actually did this multiple times during the debate. For instance, in my opening statement, I pointed out that in the book of the prophet Isaiah, we read about a child who would be born, who was going to be called the mighty God. In Isaiah 9, 6, the prophet delivers a prophecy. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. Mr. Hajab replied by saying that I simply claimed that Emmanuel means God with us. And he refuted my claim by saying that Elijah also means God with us. A couple of people have already made videos pointing out that Elijah does not mean God with us. It means my God is Yahweh. Oddly enough, Mr. Hajab's mistranslations, which he really made, don't end his career. But a more interesting point is that I never brought up Emmanuel. Go through my opening statement. I never mentioned it. So Mr. Hajab ignores my actual argument, pretends that I said something else, then refutes what I didn't say by mistranslating a Hebrew name. Again, this is a classic debate tactic. Most people who watch a debate don't remember every little detail of your argument, so they usually don't realize that your opponent is misrepresenting what you said and attacking a straw man. Debaters usually try not to do this for two reasons. One, it's dishonest. And two, even though you can score cheap debate points by doing this, you eventually get called out on it, like I'm doing in this video, and you start getting a reputation as a deceiver among debaters. So it's short-term gain, long-term loss. I went on to point out that even in various hadith collections translated by Muslims, Allah prays. I'll play the clip and put the passages on the screen so you can see what I was quoting. I pointed out that Allah prays, and he said, well, there's a difference in the meaning of the verb here. Well, the Quran says repeatedly that Allah prays, and guess what? He prays in the hadiths as well. And what's interesting is there are even Muslim translators who are acknowledging this and translating these passages as Allah prays. So uh, Aisha Buley, I've got a ton of Islamic books translated by her, respected around the world. From Riyadh as Salahin, the Messenger of Allah said, Allah and his angels and the people of the heavens and the earth, even the ants in their rocks and the fish, pray for blessings on those who teach people good. So Allah prays. Who is he praying to? Al-Ahadith Al-Qudsiyah, translated again by a Muslim translator. Hadith number 216, the Israelites said to Musa, does your Lord pray? Musa said, fear Allah, O sons of Israel. Allah said, O Musa, what did your people say? Musa said, O oh my Lord, you already know. They said, does your Lord pray? Allah said, tell them my prayer for my servants is that my mercy should precede my anger. If it were not so, I would have destroyed them. Allah prays that his mercy will triumph over his wrath. Now, if Allah is praying, what's, he's praying for self-control here, apparently, right? He wants to punish them, but he prays for self-control. This is not me. This is, these are your hadiths and your translators translating these passages as Allah praying. Why? Because that's what Salah means. So even Muslim translators acknowledge that Allah prays. Is this a career-ending mistake for them? No, they're simply saying what the Islamic sources claim about Allah. Mr. Hijab replies by insisting that he already refuted the point. He mentioned again this issue of Salah Ali, Allah. And I've told you the difference. I don't know why I kept repeating it. Did he really refute the point? He agreed with my translation and attacked a straw man. So he's not even attempting to refute what I said. He's trying to trick the audience into thinking that he refuted the point. And 
it worked. They were cheering for his refutation. And he's here saying that he prays to the Prophet. There's a difference between yusalli lahu and yusalli ala in the Arabic language. I knew this was going to happen. I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> he does go on to say later in his rebuttal that salah comes from a root that refers to connections, but he admits that salah means dua, that's supplication. He says, salah, he said, he actually asked me for something linguistic. He said, what's the linguistic basis that the, the word salah, what, is it, what does it come from? Etymologically, the word salah comes from the word sila. Sila means connection. So it can be any connection. It doesn't necessarily always have to be prayer. And the word actually salah means dua. What does salah mean? And the word actually salah means dua. So Allah prays. He supplicates. That was my entire point. If Allah prays, he's either praying to himself or he's praying to someone else. Either way, Muslims have a problem. That problem was never addressed. Instead, Mr. Hijab, who knew that I would be bringing up this point, accused me of saying something that I never said, then ridiculed me for saying something that I never said, and finally agreed completely with what I actually said. Now, why am I bringing this up? Three reasons. First, the Quran and the Hadith declare that Allah prays. Many Muslim translators try to get around this, but that's what the texts say. Muhammad Hijab admitted this. So Christians, when your Muslim friends ask, if Jesus is God, why did he pray? Be sure to point out that according to Christianity, father and son have an eternal relationship. And when the son enters creation as Jesus of Nazareth, he continues his communion with the father through prayer. This makes perfect sense in light of Christian theology. But it makes no sense for a Unitarian deity to pray, so why do the Muslim sources repeatedly declare that Allah prays? Second, for purposes of future debates, Christians who face Muhammad Hijab need to be aware of this tactic. Again, the tactic is, if your opponent gives you an argument that you can't refute, just pretend that he said something he didn't say and attack him based on the misrepresentation. If you do it well, the audience will cheer. I give credit. Where it's due, Mr. Hijab used this tactic like a pro. Third, we have to recognize that there are very different standards in Christianity and Islam. Muhammad Hijab's fans will have absolutely no problem with him using tactics like this. Just read their comments on this video. If you point out to them, David said that Allah prays for Muhammad, Mr. Hijab lied about what he said, then attacked his own lie, even though he agreed completely with David's translation, so he pretended to answer the argument, even though he never answered it. Is this wrong? Do you have a problem with this tactic? I guarantee Mr. Hijab's followers won't have a problem with it. As long as the tactic helps smash David Wood, as long as it helps give the audience the impression that the point has been addressed, honesty and integrity are irrelevant. Now, if the situation were reversed, if I had responded to Mr. Hijab's arguments by distorting his words and then attacking my own distortions, his fans would have a massive problem with it. And Christians would have a massive problem with it, because there are different sets of standards for Christians and Muslims. Muhammad said, war is deceit. So deceiving people you regard as your enemy is, regrettably, perfectly acceptable in Islam. That's what you'll find among Mr. Hijab's fans. Again, you'll see it in the comments on this video. Of course, not all Muslims are like that. Many Muslims reject these kinds of tactics. For those Muslims who reject deceptive tactics and focus instead on the evidence, keep in mind that your God, the God of Islam, prays. Muslim translators admit this, and even Muhammad Hijab admits this. Since this point was never refuted, how can we accept Tawheed? This guy is not James White. This guy is not William Lane Craig. This guy is not respectable, so he will not be treated with respect.